So please uh, join me in giving a warm <laughs> welcome to tonight's keynote speaker, Steve Rizzo. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Just checking, just checking. Got to get a level. My name is Steve Rizzo. I am originally from Brooklyn, New York. Any New York, New Yorkers? Hey, how you doing? All right. Where in New York are you from? Bay Ridge. You know Tony? She's like, I married Tony. Being from Brooklyn means I speak two languages because Brooklyn people have their own vocabulary. It's true. They have their own way of saying things, their own way of doing things. You ever see a Brooklyn cop? <laughs> Freeze! <laughs> By the way, folks, pay attention. Whenever you see me doing this little dance step like that, that means you know that I think it's funny too, okay? <laughs> My mom and dad, well, my dad mostly, though, taught me four very important things in life. I want to share this with you. My entire life, he told me that you have to be proud of who you are. You have to be proud of where you're from. You have to be proud of what you do for a living, and you absolutely need a sense of humor about all three. My dad is a psychologist, not licensed. <laughs> Seriously, not licensed, self-appointed like every other father. He always walked around, he gave us these ridiculous motivational seminars all the time, thought he knew the answer to everything, and he also thought he was king of the house. I was raised in a very tough neighborhood in Brooklyn when we were teenagers, we were getting in trouble, and my dad very simply had to lay the law down, and I'm glad he did. You ever hear this from your father when you were living home? Do you remember this? You're living in my house. All right, tough guy, you're living in my house, you're living under my roof, I pay the bills, you do what I tell you to do as long as you're living in my house. You, you're sitting in my chair, you, get your butt out there and mow the lawn. Hey, it ain't my lawn. <laughs> There, now you're part of the lawn. What do you think about that? And of course, I couldn't keep my mouth closed, and I know you're thinking, shocker. <laughs> my brothers would always tell me, shut up, don't say anything, just keep your mouth closed. Great advice, but I had a problem. The problem was, if there was a punchline there, I was going to say it. And I didn't care about the repercussions. I'm not kidding you, the biggest beating I ever got is when my father said, what kind of idiot do you think I am? My brother's in the background going, no, don't. I couldn't help it. I looked at him. I said, well, Pop, what are the categories? <laughs> My brother's going, I told you, you shouldn't have said anything. I'm like, yeah, but that was worth it. Did you hear that? That was funny. Write that down. Even the old man was laughing. Write that down. I used to love when My mother would get upset with me because you could always have fun with Mom. I mean, there were times I remember when she would be so upset, and I could actually hear her yelling at me from one end of the house, and don't make me repeat myself. And I'd go, what? And of course, what would she do? You heard me, young man. I said, don't make me repeat myself. And I'd go, what? And this would go on for hours. And I'm like, what is wrong with this woman? Answer me this. There are women in the audience here today. Maybe you have the answer. What happens to women when they become mothers? No, I'm serious. Something happens. It's like nature says, I'm sorry, but for the rest of your life, you're going to say things to your children that will make absolutely no sense to them whatsoever. One of the things my mom used to say to me, and I bet you a lot of people in this room heard this, if you're going to go outside, don't forget to put on clean underwear. How many people have heard that? Raise your hand. And what was the reasoning behind it? In case you got into an accident. Have you ever thought about that? That's all she cares about? You, you have to have on clean underwear in case you got into an accident. She used to say that, if you're gonna go outside, don't forget to put on clean underwear in case you get hit by a car. And I'm like, Mom, think about this. If I go outside and I see a car coming at me, my underwear's not gonna be clean anyway. <laughs> there was always laughter in my house, always. And how could there not be? Myself, my two brothers, my sister. And that's one of the greatest things about having children. How many, how many people out there have children? You know what I'm talking about? You wanna start your day off in a great mood, people? Before you go into work, just look at your kids, and I don't care how old they are. They are the funniest people. Sometimes we look at them as annoying little people. We gotta get them ready to go to school, get out of the house, and we gotta rush. And you bypass all the great stuff that they do. And it doesn't matter how old they are. Two years old to preteens. All right, preteens, that's a frightening category. How many people are parents of preteens? Preteens are pretty scary. That's when the hormones start going. Preteens are like old people. You tell them what to do, they walk away and they mumble. They do, you actually hear them going to their room going, I didn't even do nothing, what are you picking on me for? Every time something goes wrong, I gotta get in trouble all the time. You know what, this place is worse than living in a prison. You're probably not my real mother and father anyway. I don't even know, what are you saying? Nothing. <laughs> God, can't even breathe. Am I right with that look? Oh, I hate that look. That look like you're a blithering idiot in their eyes. <laughs> 
Then you have the whiny stage. I don't want it. Thank God we grow out of that. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe that's the attitude you need today, trying to get a raise from your boss. You don't give me nothing. I'm running away from work. This place got cooties and you suck. Boss is yelling at you on the way out. and You're going, ah, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Watch how your kids grow up to be just like you. That's hysterical. My son thinks he's a comedian. That's not funny. When he was younger and he was in elementary school, he was always making people laugh, but he didn't know when to stop. We had a problem. He was always getting in trouble. One time he came home from school. I said, hey, how was school? He said, good crowd, good crowd. <laughs> I said, don't get smart with me. He said, whoa, don't worry. I don't want to confuse you. <laughs> He even does impressions, which, is, which absolutely floors me. I'll never forget this. First day of school, true story. The teacher said, so, young man, what's your name? And he went, well, what's it to you, lady? <laughs> the teacher gave me a call. Mr. Rizzo, we have a problem. For some reason, your son thinks he's Jack Nicholson. And I'm like, what the hell do you want me to do? There's a big difference between mom and dad, too, I got to tell you that. The thing I love about my father, though, more than anything, he passed away a couple of years ago, but I, always, I will always hold on to his sense of humor. He had one of the greatest, uh, he, he laughed, he had a way of laughing at himself, laughing. My, my dad's Sicilian, 100% Sicilian, and he was always cracking jokes about his heritage, and I think that's healthy, especially today in this politically correct era that we live in. I, 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 and I learned so much from that. And, and, one of the things I miss about him is that every time we would watch the news and there was something going on in the country, my father would blurt out, you know what this country needs, don't you? What this country needs is an Italian for president. That's what this country needs. Now, when my father said what this country needs is an Italian for president, he's talking about the mob, the mafia. That's what he's talking about. And the comedian in me, after a while, I started thinking about that. I said, could you imagine if we did have an Italian for president? First of all, we wouldn't know if he was lying or not because the press would have a heck of a time with him because People from the mafia just don't like to answer questions. Mr. President, what are your plans for the future? Hey, I'm going to do things. That's all you need to know. <laughs> all right? I'm going to do this thing, that thing, and a couple other things. Who is this guy? Get his number. I want him followed. <laughs> Think about this. Excuse your mind. Picture. Let me tell you something. If we had an Italian for president right now, we wouldn't be having a problem with Iran right now at all. Because an Italian president would put Ahmadinejad in his place like that. So do me a favor, picture this, use your imaginations. Italian president, he's sitting in the Oval Office. He's with the boys. He's talking business. In the background, the national anthem's playing. Well, let's get ambassadors Tony and Louie, go over there to Iran and talk to that moron Ahmadinejad. Yeah, Ambassadors Tony and Louie are formerly from the Roy George Vending Company of New Jersey. They wind up in Iran in Ahmadinejad's office. Hey, Ami, how you doing? You know, we were talking. This is a real nice country you got here. Would be a shame if uh, something should happen to it. <laughs> Capiche? No, you know, like an accident, like God forbid. Look at the map. One day your country's here, and the next day it ain't. Bada bing, bada ball. Ahmadinejad wakes up the next morning, there's a camel's head in his bed. <laughs> See, now, if you saw The Godfather, you would know that's a very funny line. Lighten up. <laughs> Some of you are sitting there going, camel's head, that's disgusting. <laughs> also, if we had an Italian for president, it would bring a whole new meaning to the term veto power, too, wouldn't it? <laughs> Feels good to laugh, doesn't it? Hello? Feels good to laugh, doesn't it? You're looking at me like I didn't know it was going to be a quiz. Why is he asking questions? He was doing so well. Laughter has been proven scientifically to reduce stress in our lives. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. Let me tell you the real reason why I'm here. I'm here because I need the money. <laughs> I'm here very simply to show each and every one of you how to start each day with an unstoppable attitude to succeed regardless of your circumstances. See, it's my opinion that everyone is born with an abundance of optimism within them somewhere, but unfortunately, we go through the course of our lives and for whatever reason, so many of us are buried with tons of negativity. 
And it happens for many different reasons. Maybe what's happening right now with the economy, maybe it's happening the way we were raised, the way we looked at challenges. And if we're not careful, we take that negativity with us into the workplace and it can stifle creativity and productivity. So my job here is to give you the tools today in this very short time that I'm up here, to give you the tools that you need to drill for that optimism so that you can bring it to the forefront whenever you need to tap into this precious resource. Now the tools that I'm going to be giving you here today so that you can start each day with an unstoppable attitude to succeed regardless of your circumstances are what I call the incredible intangibles. Now I call them incredible for one reason, because my promise for me to you right now, is that if you take these intangibles and you make them a part of who you are, you create them and use them as habits, you can and you will create incredible results. I call them intangibles because it totally blows me away, totally blows me away, that people, most people, most of the experts, most of the books that you read on self-help and success and achieving your goals, don't consider these intangibles as criteria for leading a successful life. And it's my belief that if you use these intangibles and use them as your foundation, you can move forward with any change that's taking place in your life or any challenge that's happening. Because these intangibles enable you to bounce back, to start all over, to look at mistakes as something that needs to be learned, not as failure. And the first intangible that I wanna go over right now with you is to make a conscious choice every day to enjoy yourself during the process of whatever it is you're trying to achieve. And unfortunately, this is something that most people leave by the wayside, especially today. And I know all, a lot of you people are experiencing a lot of changes taking place within your company, implementing new ways, new products. The economy isn't in your favor at all. But if you need to make this conscious choice to enjoy yourself during the process of whatever it is you're trying to achieve, and it is something that too many people leave by the wayside, especially when you're setting out to achieve new goals. You're trying to get to the next level. You're trying to implement new ways, new ideas. Change is taking place. Challenges are coming at you left and right. That's when the stress level, stress level can get a little too intense, self-doubt, overwhelm, even fear, anger can become real dangerous mindsets. And without you ever realizing it, enjoying yourself becomes secondary. And with what you do for a living, with your responsibility, with the position that each and every one of you has, that's when it has to become primary. Studies have shown today that people who make a conscious choice, and I'll say it again, it is a choice, to enjoy themselves during the process of whatever it is that they are trying to achieve are more creative, they're more productive, they're able to bounce back a lot faster from life's challenges, they're able to find solutions to problems a lot quicker. Having said that, I'm looking at you all right now and I would wager any amount of money that most, if not all of the people in this room, when you're writing out your goals and your dreams for the future, short term, long term, or even writing out a list of things that need to be done on any given day to get things done, nowhere on those lists do you ever include enjoying yourself. That totally blows me away. Instead, what we have a tendency to do is that we create these very dangerous mindsets. We don't know we're doing it. We do this on an unconscious level. And we say things like this to ourselves. You know what? I'll enjoy myself when I achieve the goal. I'll enjoy myself when I get to where I want to go. Right now, there are too many changes taking place, too many things that need to be done, and they're not getting done. When things calm down, and I get the respect and appreciation that I think I deserve, and I get to where I want to go, that's when I'm going to enjoy myself, and I'm not going to do it one minute sooner. I'll show me a thing or two. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Some of you are looking at each other going, does he work with us? How does he know that? Do you have any idea what you're doing to yourself when you say these things? You're literally putting your happiness on hold. You're actually convincing yourself that happiness is dependent upon, your right to enjoy yourself is dependent upon something that has to take place at some point in the future. Man, that's insane, because it'll never happen. Happiness will always be a couple of steps ahead of you. The point I'm making here, people, and such an important point, the time to enjoy yourself is in the now in the moment of whatever it is that you are trying to achieve. Whether you're home cleaning the garage, walking the dogs, or you're at work trying to get to the next level. Well, now you're looking at me right now and you're going, gee, Steve, that uh, sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it does make sense. Enjoy yourself during the process. Yeah, but Steve, let me ask you something. How do you get to enjoy yourself when all these changes are taking place? 
How do you get to enjoy yourself when you feel like you're just stifled? The economy isn't as conducive as it should be for me to get to where I want to go. How do you get to enjoy yourself when I put in all this overtime and I travel all over the place and, and it's affecting my home life and I'm trying to have a home life and I'm trying to balance that with my professional life? Come on, Steve, you tell me how I am supposed to enjoy myself with all this stuff bombarding me every single day. Drugs. <laughs> I'm selling product in the back of the room later on. Those are good questions. I get these questions all the time when I give my workshops. What I'm going to give you here right now, people, is so simple, so easy. But believe me when I tell you, it works. This is how you can assure yourself to enjoy yourself during the process of whatever it is you're trying to achieve. This is one of the steps that I believe we all need to start each day with an unstoppable attitude. This is how you take control of your life, and it starts as soon as you open up your eyes in the morning to greet the day. I want you to get this. As soon as you open up your eyes, you enter into consciousness. It is at that moment that your creativity is at its most powerful. At that moment, you can steer your thoughts and your emotions in the direction that you want them to go instead of them dictating where they want you to go. In other words, you really can choose to seize the day, or you can let the day seize you. I think we could all agree, especially when change is taking place, and things are uncertain, and things aren't going the way that you want. As soon as people open up their eyes in the morning, maybe even a lot of people in this room, the first thing that they focus on is the grueling day that they had the day before, and all the things that didn't get done, and the idiots that they had to deal with. And then they start thinking about the, the day that the, that's greeting them, the coming day. And they think about, oh, I gotta get the kids ready and then I have to get to work myself and then I have to make sure that I pick them up from school and then I have to do this. Oh, and I didn't do that stuff at work. And then you can't understand why your energy level and you just started the day is down here when it has to be up here. You know the challenges that you're confronted with. If you're gonna deal with any challenge, if you're gonna achieve any goal, your energy level has to be here. It has to be cranked, and it's up to you to keep it there. So rather than think of all the crap that's bombarding you all the time and all the stuff that isn't working, start focusing on what is working in your life rather than fixating on what isn't working. Don't worry about what has to be done. Really be concerned about who you have to be in order to get it done. So what I'm asking you to do, this takes seconds, people. It takes a lot longer for me to explain this to you than it does for you to do it. As soon as you open up your eyes, what I'm asking you to do before you even take the covers off, I want you to immediately start focusing on something or someone that you are totally grateful for in your life. And notice the energy shift. When Susan was up here, by the way, give Susan a really big hand because I thought she did a really good job. She gave you a lot of great intangibles. These are the things that we bypass, man. These are the nuts and bolts that keep you together. So I want you to focus on something or someone that you are totally grateful for in your life, and I don't care who it is or what it is. Maybe it's the person lying next to you. Maybe you're thinking of your children, the dog lying on the side of the bed. Maybe you're listening to the birds outside the window. Maybe it's the beautiful home that you have, the wonderful job that you have. Maybe you're looking forward to seeing your friends at work, a vacation that you're going on, a particular goal that you achieve. It doesn't matter what it is, but I want you to feel it with your heart and soul and you build from there. Start noticing. Become aware on how much better you start feeling. Don't even allow those other thoughts to get into your head. Just keep saying, who I have to be in order to get it done. Now, why am I asking you to do this? Because gratitude is the most powerful connection you have to your higher self. You always wanna start your day connected to this part of yourself. And we all have that part of ourselves. And when you're connected to it, you know, because when you're confronted with a challenge, it doesn't bother you. Because you know that there's something within you that can meet it and move forward and learn from it. When you're not connected to it, even the slightest little change, the slightest little annoyance can blow up in your face. And then as soon as you have this attitude of gratitude going for you, take the covers off, plant your feet on the floor, and tell yourself you're going to enjoy the day. Just keep saying to yourself, you know what, I'm going to enjoy this day. This is my day, I'm not gonna have another day like this. I'm going to enjoy it. And become aware of your family. Become aware of the things that you're doing and tell yourself, I'm going to enjoy the day. Put that smile on your face. Visualize how you want your day to go. 
How many people visualize in here? What does it do for you when you visualize? Somebody yell it out. I'm sorry? Yeah, it gets your focus going. It gives you faith. It gives you hope. It gives you confidence to move forward. That's what your only goal should be when you're waking up in the morning, is to give yourself enough confidence and to feel good to get through the day. And that's what visualization does. Picture yourself dealing with these changes. Picture yourself laughing with your fellow workers, with your friends. And always, always, before you leave the house, as soon as you wake up in the morning, find the laughter within you and around you. Laughter is everywhere. It's amazing what laughter does for you. In my book, Get Your Shift Together, which is getting incredible reviews, it was Amazon bestseller the first day it came out. And I'm not saying this to impress you, just to impress upon you. This is such a simple book with so many simple tools, and it's just blowing me away on how it's helping so many people. And that's my mission in life, is to show people how to be happy and successful regardless of their circumstances. Because I'll tell you something, I don't care who you are, I don't care how much money you make, everyone in this room could look at you as the ultimate success story, but here's the bottom line. If you're not happy, you're not successful. If you're having a tough time enjoying yourself during the process of whatever it is you're trying to achieve, you're ripping yourself off. And believe me, there's enough people out there that'll try to do that for you. So find the laughter within you and around you. How many married people we have out there? Oh, there's humor there. <laughs> there's humor in marriage. Look at it. If, you don't, if you're married and you don't have a sense of humor, forget it, you're, you're lost, you're, you're not, it's not gonna work. You're gonna be miserable. And these are the things that I take with me when I go to work and I'm on the road all the time. These little things that happen between my wife and I, between my family and I. Now, if you were to read Oprah Magazine, or if you were to read Cosmopolitan, they would tell you that the key to a healthy relationship is to understand your partner. Bull. You can't understand your partner. Because there are things about the opposite sex that you will never, ever understand. The only thing you have to understand is that there are things about your partner that you will never understand. And live with that. You'll be happy. You need a sense of humor to have a marriage work. Hey, I've been married to my wife for 25 years. Until this day, I can't understand why I have to get in trouble for dreams that she has. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? You wake up in the morning, good morning. Don't you good morning me? Well, what did they do? Well, I just had a dream that you had an affair with another woman. And guys, believe me, your response should never be, really, what did she look like? <laughs> she have a blonde, or I wanna know if it's the same dream I've been having. But, hey, do me a favor, go back to sleep and get an email address, can you? <laughs> These are the things I take with me. And my wife has an incredible sense of humor, and we know intuitively, we feed off of each other. We take that with us. And it gives you energy throughout the day. One of the greatest things about relationships are the arguments we have with our partners. Arguments are hysterical. From a man's perspective, they're funny, really, because we never know what we're arguing about. Because my wife never tells me. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were having an argument. My friend called. I said, I can't talk now. Gina and I are having an argument. He goes, what are you arguing about? I said, I don't know. She didn't tell me. And you know something's wrong. You're in the car. You're ready to go out. It's going to have a nice dinner. And you look at it and go, boy, it's going to be a nice night. And she goes, mm-hmm. That's not even a word. Mm -hmm. And right then and there, I know, something's wrong. And you say to her, is something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. No, keep going, go, keep driving. Go, green light, you gotta go, you gotta go. No. Are you sure nothing's wrong? Yeah, positive. No. Mm -hmm. Nothing's wrong, yeah. So you don't say anything. Ten seconds later, you really don't care, do you? And you look at it, of course I care. That's why I asked you if something's wrong. And then she says the most illogical thing in the face of the planet. Well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Well, if you don't tell me, I'm not going to know. What am I, the amazing Kreskin? Now I can read your mind? And guys, what do we do? The dumbest thing in the world. We guess what it might be, which is stupid because then you're telling us stuff that she didn't even know about. <laughs> How many people have pets, pet lovers out there? You, you know what I'm getting at here, people? We let life pass us by. We get so caught up, and I bet you almost everyone in this room does this more times than you should. You're focusing on so much on all the stuff that's not working, on all the things that need to be done to the point, man, where you can actually, you feel like you're going out of your mind. And we let life pass us by. The things, the relationships that we have with people, that's why people so, are so disappointed that later on in the years, and they're looking back and everyone's going, well, what happened? 
I have this and I have that and I obtain this and I achieve that, but what happens? Something's missing. What's missing is that they're not enjoying the journey towards the goal. How many people have pets out there? Just watch them, man. I have, I have three labs. My wife is a dog trainer, a great dog trainer. I have three Labradors. I have a cat and I have four exotic birds. That's what my family consists of now. And it's an amazing family. And my cat, I mean, I, I was observing the cat a couple of weeks ago. How many people have cats out there? They are the most unique animals on the face of the planet. Cats, you want to know how to embrace your change, the changes that take place in your life? You look at your cat, because every cat on this planet has a New York attitude. And I say you need a New York attitude to embrace any change or any challenge that life throws at you. Because watch cats, and I don't care where they live. Cats walk around like they are nature's gift to the animal. They weep with confidence. They just walk around, you know, hey, how you doing, all right? You know, and their tails, their butt up is in the air like, yeah, that's right, kiss it, all right? I don't care, that's right. <laughs> they have New York attitudes. I swear, if cats could talk, they'd go, meow, meow, bada bing, meow. Why do you think they say cats have nine lives? Because they keep bouncing back. Nothing affects these animals. A cat could run full force, smack into a wall. <laughs> Whoa, what a rush. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> How many people have dogs? Dog lovers out there? Dogs crack me up. Dogs are the most neurotic animals on the face of the planet, though. That's why dogs crack me up. I have three labs, and they really are neurotic. They always had that stupid, guilty look on their face all the time, even if they didn't do it. You know, you come home and you go, who made this mess? Oh, God, it must have been me. I'm so sorry I was walking. It came out apparently I'm not well. Don't yell at me. Look, my tail's be Oh, it's coming out again. I'm so embarrassed. And the cat's hanging out in the living room going, what a moron. What is your problem? I did it, and you take the blame. So you have a cat? What's your cat's name? Holly. Holly. Who else has a cat? What's your cat's name? Tigger. What? <laughs> Tigger. Snicker. Oh, Tigger would a snicker. Why do we do this to our animals? They have no choice in their names. You know? Because the cat's going, Snickers. My name is Snickers. I don't believe this. I'm a stupid candy bar for crying out loud. Snickers. What the hell is Snickers? <laughs> because he looks like a candy bar. <laughs> There's logic for you. It looks like a candy bar, so <laughs> Snickers. Well, such a difference between a cat and the dog. The personalities is what cracks me up. Because you can tell any dog in the world, a dog will do anything to please you. I don't care what it is. Tell the dog, get the ball. OK, I'll get it. It could be 110 degrees. They'll do it. You tell a cat, get the ball. Hey, kiss my furry butt. I don't get dings. You want something, you tell your best friend Rover to get it. I'm busy. I got company coming over, and when they get here, don't embarrass me with this here kitty kitty stuff, all right? I got a name. You use it. Even if it is Snickers, you use it. <laughs> you know what? You're going to feel bad now. You're going to go home and look at your cat and say, I'm really sorry. I didn't know. I, I simply didn't know. It's OK. This is the stuff. This is why I can actually say that I enjoy my life. I consider myself really successful. I enjoy my life, though. I enjoy the process. I'm confronted with challenges like anybody else. I'll talk about that a little bit later on, on what I do to deal with it. I have four exotic birds. Anybody have birds out there? I have an African gray people, and we wean these birds since they were babies. Now, if you were to go online, I challenge anyone to do this, go online anytime and look up the African gray. It's considered the smartest animal on the planet. It beats out chimpanzees, dolphins, dogs, everyone. This, do this bird will talk like me to get my wife's attention and will talk like my wife to get my attention. It sings complete songs, and it has a sense of humor. It sits on a perch, and sometimes it'll get off the perch in the kitchen. This happened to me just a couple of days ago. The bird gets off the perch, and the dog was in the way, and the bird goes, Wally, move. I said now. And the dog goes, Jesus, what the hell was that? <laughs> and as the dog is walking away, the bird's going, good boy, good boy. It, sat, it sits on a perch, and it'll beckon to all three dogs, and I am not kidding you. People that come over and see this just flip out. It sits on the perch, and it beckons to the dogs. It goes, Wally, Jesse, Brandy, dinner's ready. And the dogs are running around the house looking for their food. 
and then they look up at the bird, the bird's on the perch going, ah, 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 <laughs> This is the stuff I take with me. Wake up in the morning, focus on what's working. Don't fixate on what isn't working. Bless the things that life has given you rather than cursing what life hasn't given you. Make that conscious choice and tell yourself you're going to enjoy the process. Visualize how you want your day to go. Find the laughter within you and around you. People, this is not Pollyanna mumbo jumbo. Scientists are all in agreement today that our lives move in the direction of our most dominant thoughts and what we focus on day in and day out. Not only do our lives move in the direction of our most dominant thoughts and what we focus on, but those very things that we're focusing on and thinking about are moving closer to us. In other words, the more you focus on your lack, the more of that you're going to get back. The more you focus on what isn't working, the more your life isn't going to work. Never, ever, ever underestimate the power of your thoughts. Because what you think is what you get. When I give my, when I give, when I speak to a lot of groups on change, and I'm, you know, I know you people are experiencing different types of changes, it amazes me because you know, all of you, I can, I can look at all of you right now, and I, I know basically you all have uh, the, the same type of educational background. You have similar positions. You dealt with the same challenges, the same changes that are taking place. And I know for certain that some of the people in this room are going to be able to embrace the change, are going to be able to do more with it. They're going to move forward as a result. Some people are going to do it, but they're not going to like it, and it's going to cause them a lot of stress, and some people are going to find it very difficult. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it that some of you can handle it, and some of you are going to have a very tough time? I'll tell you why. Because it's not the change that's taking place. It's not the situation. It's not the circumstance. It's the thoughts that you have about it that will determine how successful and how happy you're going to be. Never underestimate the power of your thoughts, because what you think is what you get. What you say out loud is what you ask for. I'll give you a perfect example on how your thoughts can blow something out of proportion. I know a woman <laughs> saved for years to go on her dream vacation, okay? Now, when she got there, it rained six out of the seven days, and I was laughing my butt off. And the reason why I was because I know this woman, and she's straight from the negative zone. No matter what good comes into her life, she will find something wrong with it. Does anyone know anyone like that? Oh, yeah, look, you're looking at the person next to you going, you know, I think you should listen to this guy. <laughs> I really think he's addressing you right now. She's straight from the negative zone. You know what I say she has? She has an acute case of the droopy dog syndrome. Remember that cartoon character, Droopy Dog, always walking around going, oh boy, I just know something horrible's gonna happen. Everything has to happen to me. Even when she laughs, she goes, ha. Ah. <laughs> this woman could win $500 million in the lottery, and her attitude would be, oh boy, I just know this was gonna happen. The government's going to take half, and I'll only wind up with $250 million. It's the kind of a person we just want to go, come here, come here for a minute, and just smack him right in the back of the head. And I think we should be allowed to do that. I really think we should have a law and call it the whiny law. And when someone is whining in a public setting, it could be anywhere, any kind of a setting, doesn't matter. Waiting in line at the supermarket, and that person's whining, smack him right back of the head, just to snap him out of it. Anyway, when this woman came, uh, talking to me about her vacation, I let her vent, and boy, did she vent. Oh, Stephen, you know how long and how hard I saved to go on this vacation, but you also know darn well if something's going to happen to somebody, it's going to happen to me. It's been happening to me ever since I was a little kid. We scrimped and we saved to go on vacation. When we got there, it rained almost every single day. The rain ruined our vacation. Did you see my brother? Did you see my brother when he came back a couple of days ago? Did you see him? Everybody was nice and tan. They went on vacation for two weeks. You want to know why they were nice and tan? Because they had sunshine every single day. But not us. The rain ruined our vacation. The rain didn't ruin this woman's vacation. It would have been nice if she had some good weather, but she didn't. What really ruined her vacation? Her attitude. But what created this attitude? Her way of thinking, people, what we were just talking about. 
her way of thinking, her thoughts formulated that attitude. Those thoughts formulated the belief system that she had about. She didn't even give herself a chance for alternatives to try to have a good time. As a matter of fact, this stayed with her for a long, long time because she couldn't wait to tell the next person about what happened to her on vacation, reliving it every single time she did it. You know what that does to your system? You know what that does to your overall happiness? That's how you become a victim. You can't deal with any challenge if you had that kind of a mentality. So it was her thoughts about the rain that ruined her vacation. Now, something on the contrary of this woman, I also know a couple that when they went on vacation, not only was the weather horrific, but two flights were canceled, one was delayed, yet they came back and they said they had a great time. Now, what do you think separates this woman with the droopy dog syndrome from this latter couple that I'm talking about? Anybody? No, no, the latter couple were on drugs. <laughs> See, they didn't even go on vacation. <laughs> they were so high, they were in their living room, they thought they were on vacation. You want another pina colada, honey? I'm going to jump in the pool. <laughs> no, the latter couple somehow knew the power of their thoughts. And I asked my friend Charlie, because he didn't even know what he did to himself. And if you knew Charlie, you would have asked him the same thing, too. Because I said, Charlie, are you telling me you didn't get upset at all? He goes, oh, no, I got upset. I vented. I told the airline people what I thought. I said, well, what turned it around? He goes, I don't know. I guess after waiting at the airline terminal for three days on and off, we were finally getting on the plane to go to where we wanted to go. And I noticed that we were both in really bad moods and something clicked. And he looked at his wife and he said, hey, honey, we got to turn this around. We're still on vacation. We already paid for this. All right, three days are gone, but we have another seven days left. I know it looks like the weather's going to be pretty bad, but there's got to be something that we can do to turn this around. We owe it to ourselves. Maybe when we get to the hotel, we'll go to the concierge, and we'll ask them if there are different excursions that we can go on while it's raining. And all of a sudden, Sarah, his wife, started jumping in on the enthusiasm. You're right, Charlie. We can turn this around. We wanted a nice rendezvous together. Now's our chance to do it. Well, well not do it, but, you know, to, to have a good time. So as a result of not even doing this, not even realizing what they were doing, of making all these positive statements during these challenging times, they reinforced a positive belief system. Their intention and their focus was just on having a good time, not on the things that were showing them that they were having a bad time. As a result, they were able to come back and they said they had a great time. As a matter of fact, they looked at the whole experience and I thought this was really cool, his choice of words. They looked at it as an adventure. It was an adventure for them. Whereas the person with the droopy dog syndrome looked at it as a catastrophe. That's the attitude you need to deal with any change that's taken place in your life. That's the attitude you need, and it's all based on choices. Does everyone follow me on the moral of that story? I hope that you do, because this is what we do to ourselves. It's so difficult to take responsibility when life throws challenges at us. It's so easy to blame. It's so easy to blame the economy, the company, the people that work for you, the president, the, the, the God, nature. It's so easy to blame outside circumstances for you not being happy or successful. And yet the key to true success, to true happiness, is to take responsibility to know that it's not what happens to you that determines how successful or how happy you're going to be. It's what you do about what happens. It's the choices that you make. And it is all based on choices. Your entire life is based on the choices that you make. And for every choice that you make, there is always, always a consequence, always. Whether it's made consciously or unconsciously. Here's how powerful your choices are. Take a couple of seconds, think about this. Where you are at this point in your life is based on choices that you made at some point in the past. Those choices are the key factors that determine the quality of life that you have right now. If you don't like the way your life is going on any level, personally and professionally, it's time for you to sit down, to reflect, to make different choices, and to tweak your life in certain areas where you want it to go. At least get it relatively close. At least you know you're on your way. And while you're doing this, I can't stress this enough, please understand, your sense of humor is your sense of perspective. One of the most powerful intangibles you could ever use, your sense of humor. I have studied this thing, humor, for years. Being a stand-up comedian, 
doing all the TV stuff that I did and, and headlining clubs all over the country, I started looking at humor from a different perspective. I consider myself an expert on humor and the power of positive thinking. And I have found that humor, if you allow it to, if you allow it to become a part of who you are, humor nips, <clears throat> excuse me, literally nips negative thought patterns in the bud before they blossom into emotional havoc. What an incredible power to give to yourself. What an incredible gift to give to yourself. Here's a perfect example on how the ability to laugh, something that happened to me in my life years ago in the middle of my comedy career, was one of the most stressful situations. And all of a sudden, my ability to laugh in the midst of this stressful situation turned it around and led to the most important break in my comedy career. Now follow me on this. I was in New York City. I had a rental car that kept breaking down. It was 98 degrees. The air conditioning isn't working. Sweat is pouring down my face. I'm in the world's biggest traffic jam. The car keeps breaking down. It seems like every New Yorker on the planet was just beeping their horns and cursing at me. That's not a secure feeling at all. To top it off, I'm already over a half hour late for a very important audition. Now I'm feeling a snowball of negativity building up and I'm like, oh man, what else could possibly happen? Don't ever ask that question. <laughs> Don't, because if you do, the universe will answer you. Okay, I'll show you, and it happened. Folks, I drive up to the toll booth and I went to pay the guy and I realized I left my money home. I didn't have any money. I don't know what possessed me. I just looked at the guy in the booth and I said, hey, I'll have a couple of burgers, two fries and get something for yourself there, Sparky. Now, apparently this guy was new in the country and I didn't know this at the time. The poor guy looked at me and he says, I'm very shoddy, but we do not have food here. I said, well, then you better get it because you're holding up traffic. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I notice he's starting to laugh. He finally gets the joke. Now, I'm laughing too, but all the cars in back of me, they're beeping the horns going, hey, come on, move it. We got to get going. I swear to you, my newfound friend in the toll booth sticks his head out and motions to all of the other cars, and he says, I'm very shoddy. We ran out of food. Try the next booth. <laughs> By then, we were hysterical. We were high-fiving each other. We became best friends in 30 seconds. You want to know the coolest thing? He let me go without paying. This guy didn't know me from Adam. He just told me, listen to me, my friend. I want to tell you that this tone is on me. I'm taking care of it. I just want you to understand something. I am brand new in this country, and this is only my second day on the job. And believe me when I tell you, I really needed to laugh today. And I looked at him, and I said, so did I. <laughs> now, here's the point, and a very important point. I drove away from that toll booth in a totally different state of mind. Totally different state of mind. As a result, I was able to plant positive thoughts in my head, constructive ways on how I can deal with this very important audition that I had coming up. And guess what, folks? I had a great audition. And it's a good thing I did. Led to the most important break of my comedy career. That's how I got my first TV special, my Showtime special. That special paved the way for every other TV special that I've ever gotten. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you think would have happened if I would have gone into that audition in the mood that I was in before the Tollbooth incident? I wouldn't have had a chance. Not in the mood that I was in. I wouldn't have had a chance. And I tried everything in my power to get into a good mood, because at that time, I started reading all those books on positive thinking and affirmations. And I found something out very important. Sometimes your brain is in such an overwhelming negative state, it just isn't going to buy the fact that everything is OK. And I realized it's only when I started to laugh was I able to think positive. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Here's the psychological reasoning behind this. Because when you start laughing at a negative, stressful situation like that, your brain is no longer focusing on that negative situation because your brain can only think one thing at a time. Your brain is now somewhere else and it's laughing at something ridiculous that you just did. And even if your brain does go back to that negative situation, which it will do eventually, but the cool thing is that it won't be as overpowering as it was before. Why? Because You've calmed your nervous system down to the point where you can control the situation instead of having the situation control you. You'll never know when opportunity is going to knock, when that big break is going to come, especially when you're going through tough times, especially when change is taking place. You're never going to know. And you have to be emotionally stable to be in that state of mind to reap the benefits of opportunity. I can't tell you how many opportunities I've blown in my life because I couldn't control my emotions. How many bridges I burned because I made decisions when I was in an unhealthy state of mind. That's one of the reasons why I do what I do today. 
And it doesn't matter what you call it. You can call it karma, payback, the laws of cause and effect. One of the hard facts of life, and it's a law, the choices you make determine the actions that you take. The actions you take will determine the outcome. That will determine whether it's successful, unsuccessful, positive, or negative. And again, it's all based on choices. That's why I urge people every day to start their day and tell yourself you're going to enjoy the day. By telling yourself you're going to enjoy the day and looking at the things that you're grateful for and finding humor in things doesn't mean you're not going to be confronted with challenges. Of course you will. That's why I ask you to do these things. Because these are the tools you need to help you to bounce back, to create different habits. So many of us are going through our lives, you go through your entire life not knowing that you have negative habits that you've created and they dominate your life. Why not turn it around? Why not make that choice to enjoy the process? You know, one of the great things that you can do to enjoy yourself is do something great for somebody. That'll bounce you back. Whenever you feel, you're just not feeling right. Do something nice for somebody. No much, no, notice how much better you feel. Like if you're walking through town and you see a parking summons on someone's windshield, go over to that car, rip that sucker up, and throw it away. <laughs> no, <laughs> why should that person have to pay for that? Do things, do little things. That particular day, and with that toll booth incident, I turned, tuned into what I call my humor being. Everyone in this room has a humor being within them. Your humor being is of your higher self. It's the part of you that brings out the best in you when times get really tough. What your humor being can give you more than anything else is emotional stability. That's what we need today to deal with the changes that are taking place with what you people are confronted with. Emotional stability. It's tough enough as it is to have the position that you have, the responsibility that you have, knowing that other people are depending on you. And then you have to have these outside circumstances. Why not arm yourself with the tools that can help you to live an easier life, a better life, a simpler life? When I'm in traffic and I know I'm going to get upset, because most people are, I, I shift. And I get into my sense of humor. I turn into the lion from The Wizard of Oz. I figure it's going to be hours before I get home, so what the heck? I'm going to have fun. Everyone else is angry. Their blood pressure is going high. They're beeping the horns. They're cursing at each other. Watch them. It's insane out there. Not me. If you ever look at me in traffic, I'm looking right back going. <laughs> I want to go home. I want to go home. <laughs> yeah, you laugh. People in the next car are going, don't look at him, and he won't say anything. Oh, my God, he's a pervert, honey. He's got a New York license plate. Lock the door. Look straight ahead. Don't look at him. He's probably naked from the waist down. Don't look at him. You might think I'm crazy, so might everyone else that's in traffic, but here's the point. At least I know I'm not going to work in a bad mood. I'm not going home in a bad mood. No matter where I'm going, no matter what I'm doing, I'm going there in a good mood. Again, I was able to change my state of mind. I'm not saying you have to do the line from The Wizard of Oz, but I am saying there are things that you can do. There are altern alternatives. Hey, I know what stress is. Are you kidding me? I fly 300,000 miles a year. That's domestic alone. Sometimes I'm in four cities in five days. Sometimes I have a half-day seminar to give, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes my butt is dragging. But the thing that juices me more than anything else, the thing that helps me to bounce back more than anything else, it's not caffeine, it's not alcohol, it's not drugs. I mean, I do those things, but it's none of those things. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Look, some of you are looking at each other going, told you, <laughs> told you. It's when I turn my humor being loose in a public setting. That's what cracks me up. That's what gives me joy. And I'm noted for doing that. People that hang out with me, friends, family, when I get into that mood where I feel I have to unwind, oh man, I'm an observer. I'm a people observer. And when I see things that crack me up, it just juices me to get through the day. I'm in hotels my entire life, and I'm always having fun with the hotel staff because they never get it. We're all back, I was at the Ritz Carlton, maid service knocked on my door and said, Mr. Rizzo, can I turn down your bed? I opened up the door and I said, why, is it too loud? She didn't get it. She just looked at me and said, no, well, he's weird. I'm not going back in this room. I'll tell you that right now. So I go back to my room at the Ritz-Carlton, and I realized they did turn down my bed. You know what turn down service is, right, folks? That's when housekeeping comes in at some point during the day when you're not there, and they rearrange your room so that when you go back in, you have no idea where anything is. The thing that cracks me up more than anything else about turn down service, does anyone know what it is? It's that stupid piece of chocolate that they put on your pillow. We're supposed to consume this. It's a nightcap. Nightcap, are you kidding me? 
Why is it that hotel people don't know what the rest of us know? Chocolate does not help you sleep. It has a complete opposite effect. It has a lot of caffeine in it. The comedian in me, thinking of the absurdity of this, I dialed the front desk the next morning and said, hey, I want to thank you for that chocolate last night. It really helped me sleep. Well, you're very welcome, Mr. Rizzo. Is there anything else that we could do for you? I said, yeah, I was wondering. Maybe tonight you could put a vial of crack and a pot of coffee on my pillow. I think that'll help me sleep. You want to know what he said? Oh, I don't think we could do that. <laughs> How did he not get that? Before I leave, I, I, I want to I I end with this story. Change is going to come in your life one of two ways, by choice or by circumstances beyond your control. Okay? Just get that. It's inevitable. And the changes that you experience are going to continue. And you have to know how to deal with it. Because I hear people say, accept change. Accept it. That's not good enough. Because in my opinion, when you say accept change, what you're actually saying is, well, okay, I'll do it, but I'm not going to like it. Okay, I'll do it, but I don't know what good's going to come out of it. And then there's a negative connotation there. You, you get what I'm saying? So what I'm asking you to do, and I want you to understand this, I'm asking you to embrace the change. Now, what does that mean? When I say embrace the change, that means you're going through it, even if you can't feel it right away, that you know that somehow, some way, some good will come out of even the most intense change, okay? The biggest inspiration of my life is my brother, Michael. No one has taught me more on how to embrace the changes in life more than he has. No one has taught me more on how to move forward with a positive attitude more than he has. No one has taught me more on how important it is to have a sense of humor and to enjoy yourself during the process of rebuilding yourself when life throws something hard at you more than he has. He's 100% disabled as a result of the Vietnam War. He's the only man in medical history, as far as they know, that survived that kind of wound. He's in medical journals and, and, and magazines and as someone who beat the odds. 21 feet of his small intestine were either taken out or blown out on the battlefield. His Internal organs would damage his kidneys as well. And the only reason why I'm being graphic here is that I want you to understand what he went through so you can appreciate how he beat this. I'll never forget the first time that I saw him in St. Albans Naval Hospital. And another thing I want to, I want to, I want to say before I even get into this is that the tools that he used to embrace this change are the same exact tools that you can use to embrace the changes that are taking place in your life right now. It doesn't matter. Change is change. The tools to deal with it are the same. I'll never forget the first time that I saw him in, in St. Albans Naval Hospital in Queens, New York. And if it hadn't been for my mom and dad in the room with him, I never would have known it was him. He went from 168 pounds to 88 pounds. In the room with my mom and dad were his two friends from high school and his Marine Corps buddy whom he had gotten wounded with. And the whole day my brother was going in and out of consciousness and it was at the end of the day when the doctors came in and told my mom and dad, said, I'm sorry, it doesn't look like he's gonna make it, not even through the night. I'll never forget the look on my mom and dad's face. His two friends from high school walked out of the room. His Marine Corps buddy was hitting the wall, and to no one in particular, he was just saying, why? I was only 17 years old at the time, and I remember staring at my brother, wondering if this is going to be the last time that I'm ever going to see him. We have a very close family. And all of a sudden, I noticed something weird starting to happen. <laughs> I noticed his hand is slowly starting to rise from his side. He's supposed to be unconscious now. And he slowly clenched his fist, and up came his middle finger. <laughs> right then and there, I knew he was going to try and make it. Why? Because he still had his sense of humor. And that was the attitude that he had, and that was the answer he gave to that doctor's diagnosis, and that was the answer he gave them every single time. They told him he couldn't and wouldn't be able to do something. Till this day, we call the raising of that middle finger the finger of optimism. <clears throat> First, they said he wouldn't live long. Well, they're wrong, because he's alive today. Right? Then they said, okay, he's going to have to eat certain foods for the rest of his life, like liquids and baby food and oatmeal, because they didn't think that his body, with only one foot of small intestine, they didn't think his body would be able to handle anything of any substance. You want to know what my brother's attitude was? My brother said, hey, don't you ever tell me what I'm going to eat, all right? I'm going to eat a bowl of pasta and a couple of meatballs, even if I have to sit on the toilet while I'm eating it. <laughs> and you're laughing, but you know what the coolest thing was? That he lived long enough where his small intestine stretched a bit. 
and he was able to compensate and use the rest of his digestive system for what his small intestine could no longer do. Till this day, when he goes for checkups, doctors can't believe that he's here. They call him the Miracle Man. That's his nickname. They go, hey, Miracle Man's here. And here's my point to you. I believe we all have opportunities to perform our own miracles when life is throwing change in our face. It's a matter of what you believe. And where do your beliefs come from? The thoughts that you keep programming in your brain day in and day out. My brother incorporated an incredible, an impeccable belief system. First of all, he never said, why me? Which is what we have a tendency to do. I bet you a lot of people in this room have done that with these changes. I think, oh, here we go again. Why me? Why is this happening to us again? That's the worst thing you can do. Because you're making a tough situation worse. You're opening up the door to the negative zone, and most of the time you go in. Instead, my brother said, instead of why me, he said, this is me. This is what happened to me. What do I have to do to turn this around? Who can I go to that can help me? He never focused on what was missing in his life. He always focused on what he had left. One time, I'll never forget this, where my brothers and I used to try and feed him sandwiches. You know, he, the doctors ordered him not to eat any f solid foods at all. So we, you know, sl slice a pizza over here. And the doc one time, the doctor came by and he saw my brother eating a, a sandwich, a fat sandwich. And the doctor said, you're not supposed to be eating anything, you know. And he started reprimanding. My brother took the sandwich and threw it right at the doctor, hit him square in the chest. My brother said, you want to know what your problem is, doc? You keep focusing on the 21 feet that are missing, and I keep focusing on the one foot I have left. Let's try it my way just for once. The doctor walked away, came back a couple of days later, and apologized and said, you're right, let's try it your way. And that's the way he did it. The thing that, and if he were here, he would tell you this, the thing that helped him to survive more than anything else, and I really want you guys to get this, is that he just knew intuitively to make a conscious choice to enjoy himself during the rebuilding process of this change that took place. That is what I believe separated him from everyone else that was in that hospital. And I'm not passing judgment here. I was there almost every day, and I know these guys had their own pain to deal with. But I honestly believe what separated my brother from them is that most of these people were saying, how can I enjoy myself and find the laughter the way I am? Or they were saying, you know what, I'll enjoy myself and find the laughter if and when I get better. My brother said, no, I'm going to enjoy myself during this process, and I'm going to surround myself with people who could make me laugh. As a result, it helped him to get better. You see the difference in that mindset? To make a long story short, he was in a hospital for close to a year. When he got out, he was 95 pounds, and he said he was going to go to college. And we didn't think he could do it because he wasn't Mr. Whiz Kid in high school. But he did go. He had to go at night. He got straight A's. They let him go full time. Graduated with degrees in psychology, administration, and history. Went back to the same school that he graduated from, taught history. From history, he became an attendance officer. From there, he became assistant principal. From there, he became a principal. Then when he wanted to retire, they wouldn't let him do it. They made him superintendent of the entire school system. He just recently retired a couple of years ago. Now he's traveling the world. Now you're looking at me right now and you're going, gee, Steve, that's a, that's a wonderful story, but what does that have to do with us? Well, nothing. I just had some time to kill and I thought maybe you'd... <laughs> it has everything to do with you because the moral of the story, people, it's not the changes that take place in our lives that will determine how successful or how happy you're going to be. It's the thoughts that you have about the change that makes the difference. It's the thoughts about the change that formulates the attitude and the belief that you have about that change that makes the difference. And will you challenge yourself to enjoy yourself during this process? And will you dare to find the laughter in between the tough times? So before I leave, I want you to do these three things. Every morning, as soon as you wake up. Again, as soon as you open up your eyes, focus on what you're grateful for. Focus on what's working rather than fixating on what isn't working. Tell yourself you're going to enjoy the day. The second thing that I want you to do is to tell yourself, today is an opportunity for me to make a difference in someone's life. Sometimes you have to search for that. Think about what you do. Think about the position that you hold. Think about the choices that you make. You do make a difference. And when you believe that before you go to work, it, it gives you a whole different type of energy to get things done. It gives you self-confidence. Third thing that I want you to do every single day for the rest of your life is to find the laughter within you and around you. Tap into that wonderful gift. Tap into your humor being. Ask your humor being for guidance. It's there. It's everywhere. 
Challenge yourself to look at the news as if it were the comedy channel. With what's going on today, you have to laugh at some of this stuff. I agree there's a lot of stuff you can't laugh at, but there's a lot of stuff on there, man, where you don't laugh, you're going to go out of your mind. I'm not going to tell you my political views or anything like that, but I, I have to laugh off the stuff that really gets me a little ticked off. I heard this on the news. 1% of the ozone layer is gone. It's never coming back. Very serious topic. Does anyone know what the main reason is for this? It's cow gas. It's ca Did anyone hear this besides me? Raise your hand. I'm not making this up. You heard about it? It was on a Discovery Channel. I'm cracking up. They did studies. Apparently, the methane from cow gas is destroying the ozone layer. They said that they weighed it. And I'm like, weighed it? How do you weigh cow gas? My, and who's the guy that has this job? <laughs> all of a sudden, your job doesn't seem that stressful after all, does it? And what's his title? Hi, I'm a bovine flatulence engineer. In layman's terms, it means I weigh cow gas. That's an embarrassing job, because you know everybody makes fun of this guy. Even the cows make fun of this guy. Hey, he's right in back here. I know, I just ripped one so hard, milk came out of my nose. <laughs> What's he doing now? He's crying, that's what he's doing. Hey, Elsie, rip another one, see what happens. Wait a minute, pull my hoof. You guys have been wonderful. I hope I was able to help. Thank you so much for having me. I want to thank my sponsors. Thank you. Thank you so much, people. And listen, I want you to do yourself a favor. It doesn't cost you anything. When you get a chance, you go on my website, steverizzo.com. Opt in to sign up for my Rizzogram. Buy weekly Rizzogram. You'll get articles on how to get through the tough times, some funny videos, some poignant videos from very good friends of mine, influential people that have number one bestseller books out there. It'll really help you. It's getting great reviews. steverizzo.com. Thank you so much, people. You've been great. Appreciate it.